Hey, and welcome back to Guillotine 18th Century Chemist Theater. Today we're going to talk all about pressure, not peer pressure, but atmospheric pressure. Um, right now you have 50 miles of the atmosphere pushing down on you right now. Um, so you're used to pressure, believe it or not. You have about 15 pounds per square inch pushing on you. You, you live in the existence of pressure. Just like things at the bottom of the deep ocean live under a lot of pressure too. You know, they're used to that kind of pressure and if the pressure changes, they don't do so well, just like you also. But changes in pressure is something for another time. Today we're just gonna focus on the ways that you measure it. Um, and, and what are the units? There are a lot of units for pressure that have developed over the year. Look at all these. Um, you've got the atmosphere, which sort of makes sense. It's the atmosphere, the pressure that you'd imagine in a city like Paris. They've measured it at Paris. Um, you have millimeters of mercury, inches of mercury, very popular for meteorology. And we'll talk about where the idea of millimeters of mercury come from, why we would use that to measure pressure. Uh, Pascals is actually the metric unit for pressure, but that's such a uh, tiny thing compared to atmospheric pressure that the kilopascal is very popular, uh, 101.325 of those equal atmospheric pressure uh, but uh, even more popular is the idea of a bar a bar is, is is the atmospheric pressure at sea level which is about one percent different than atmospheric pressure atm um, so you see bars uh, actually gaining a lot of favor and of course psi pounds per square inch anybody who has a bicycle in america uh, knows all about psi pressure on tires anyway they're all pretty interchangeable um, as long as you keep your units the same, most times you can get away with whatever pressure you want to get away with. And you just need to be able to convert them. So, for instance, if we wanted to convert inches of mercury to kilopascals, uh, we would just use those conversions, put inches of mercury on the bottom, because 29.92 inches of mercury is the same thing as 101.325 kilopascals. Now, should you memorize those? Eh, it's up to you. Uh, the more you memorize, the more content you have handy, the easier this stuff will be. Um, and, and the more common sense you can use to check your work. But is it a deal killer? Eh, you know, couldn't hurt. And so that 95.1 kilopascals, remember that again, think of sea level as, as 100 kilopascals or one bar, um, and then work up from there. And so as we mentioned before, the SI unit for pressure, the official one is the Pascal, and that is a Newton per square meter. Um, Newtons are sort of like the equivalent of pounds in the metric system. Uh, but again, you'll get to that when you get to physics, or if you're already in physics, you already know. Um, again, one atmosphere sounds like a nice way to measure pressure. Uh, typ typical, that's the pressure you'll feel in like a city like Paris as opposed to sea level. Um, but we, everybody needs a standard temperature and pressure. And, and surprisingly, uh, standard conditions like SDP are not all that standard. In fact, uh, some people get into a lot of trouble saying they do stuff under standard conditions and other people don't understand what those standard conditions are. Um, the IUPAC, my favorite governing body, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, actually defines it as zero degrees Celsius and one bar. Um, I used to think it was one atmosphere, but that's, but that's actually about a 1% difference. There are some people that still use one atmospheres, like the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, they used one atmosphere, but, but if we want to stick with the IUPAC, they, they prefer one bar, which is interesting. Anyway, so, there, so just be careful about what you think standard conditions are, because it, it varies depending on whose standard it is. And so one of the ways we can measure pressure is with a barometer, and that's sort of the standard way to talk about it. If you understand how a barometer works, you really do understand pressure pretty well. And so let's talk about a barometer, and then we'll talk about a manometer. And if people mispronounce it or think it's scary, don't, don't, don't make fun of them. You know. So, the barometer. Um, if you were to stick a straw in a, in a liquid, nothing would really happen because pressure on the inside of the straw would equal pressure on the outside of the straw. Now, you might get a little rise due to capillary action, but other than that, not much is going to happen. Even if you were to put your finger over the top of it, nothing happens because there's still atmospheric pressures trapped inside the straw. So the inside is still pushing as hard as the outside. Imagine a swinging door in a restaurant and the inside people are pushing as hard as the people on the outside. Um, even if someone locks the front door of the restaurant, that's not going to affect the fact that that swinging door between the kitchen and the restaurant restaurant still has people pushing on either side. No, where, where a barometer gets interesting and when it actually becomes a barometer is if you evacuate the gas inside that straw. Um, now you can't really do that with a, with a classic straw. If you were to insert, if you were to take a straw underwater and lift it out with your finger on top, the straw would collapse due to atmospheric pressure. So you need something a little tougher like a glass tube. And it turns out the exact size of the glass tube doesn't really matter as long as it's pretty small. It'll work the same either way. 
But if there's nothing pushing back from the inside, uh, what will happen is the atmosphere will push that liquid up the straw higher and higher and higher. Now, it's not getting sucked up there by anything in the inside because there's nothing in the inside. It's a vacuum. The atmospheric pressure is pushing it up the straw. And as it pushes it up higher and higher, the column gets heavier and heavier until the atmosphere can push it up no higher. And then it's stuck there. And so the weight of that column is the equivalent of atmospheric pressure. And so if we measure how high the column is, you can get a good feel for what the atmospheric pressure is. And that's really pretty neat. Remember, there's nothing pulling that up. A lot of people think that there's something sucking that up. And we'll find out the idea of trying to think of things moving up and down straws or tubes by somebody sucking it up. Um, uh, that, that's, a, that's a big mistake. It's really the atmosphere pushing stuff that moves these liquids around. Everything's really a push. Um, and so as, as pressure gets higher, then it's going to be a harder push, and it's going to be able to shift it up higher. And as pressure gets lower, just the opposite would happen. And so uh, it would drop lower because there's not as big of a push, and so it can't push the liquid up as high. And if you ever see this in your barometer, I hope you're in a space suit because there is no pressure then. Again, if the, if the column isn't going up, then the pressure on the outside equals the pressure on the inside, which is zero. Now, this is where inches of mercury come into play, or millimeters of mercury, because instead of using water, you could use water, but you'd need about uh, a 30-foot tube because water is not that dense. So you want to get a nice dense liquid, and that's where mercury comes into play. You can get away with about a, you know, a, a meter of mercury is plenty. Um, if you were to have a tube of glass a meter long uh, and then take it under mercury and then lift it out so there's no air inside of it, you'd get up with a vacuum at the top and then the atmosphere would push the mercury up about 75 centimeters, give or take. Um, so there you go, homemade, homemade barometer if you have a pool of mercury sitting around. But you can also do manometers too, um, no elephantometers. <laughs> But the idea is you've got two pressures now. You don't, it's, not, it's not against a vacuum. And so again, there's lots of different ways that this is done. But the general idea is one of these pressures is known, one of these pressures is unknown, and you're looking for changes in pressure. Right now, the pressure on the inside equals the pressure on the outside. The liquid doesn't go up or down. But as pressures start to change, uh, the, the, you're going to see the liquid rising or falling one side or the other. And so manometers are a good way to get a relative idea of pressure change. If all you care about is knowing that the pressure is changing, then a manometer is a, a fun idea. Um, you know, and pressure changes are actually really important in weather and meteorology because pressure changes often indicate changes in weather. So remember, the big difference is a barometer has no atmosphere inside of it, but a manometer does. Um, and then finally, we'll finish up with a good old tire gauge. Uh, interesting, if you have a tire gauge sitting on a table, it's reading zero. Well, it doesn't mean there's zero pressure in the room. Um, tire gauges actually read which is what's known as gauge pressure, which is pretty interesting, um, as opposed to absolute pressure, which is the pressure above atmospheric pressure. Um, you know, so just be careful when you're reading a tire and it says 20 psi. That's probably 20 psi above atmospheric pressure. Um, all, everything's at atmospheric pressure. An empty bag is at atmospheric pressure. If someone offers to come up and, and put all your tires at atmospheric pressure, one of the chem bullies comes up and says, hey, I'll put all your tires at atmospheric pressure for five bucks. Uh, drive your car away immediately because all they have to do is slash your tires. Uh, and then once your tires have a big gaping hole in them, they will reach atmospheric pressure very quickly. So be careful about that. So. Anyway, there's a lot of really interesting ramifications of pressure changes, and, and we've run out of time today. But what, next time what we'll do is we'll talk about uh, some of the pressure changes that come with pressurized cabins. Um, and even the idea of breathing and how straws work are great examples of changes in pressure. But think about that barometer. If you think about that barometer, the rest of this stuff comes out pretty uh, uh, simple. So anyway, so that's all we'll do for today, introducing the concept of pressure and, uh, you know, yeah. Remember, you're used to dealing with a lot of pressure, so um, don't, let, don't let that get you down. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.